Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the Children's, Seniors, and Family uh, Committee and Finance and Government Operations Committee. We notice these both at the same time because the, um, because the two of us sit on both committees. So what we're going to do is we're going to begin with public comment. And um, with that, we will begin. Uh, well, first, actually, Ignacio, can we start with introductions? Thank you. Ignacio Guerrero, Director for the Department of Child Support Services. Bob Minacucci, Director, Social Services Agency. Good afternoon. Rob Coelho from County Council's Office. Cindy Chavez, Member of the Board of Supervisors. Dave Cortezzi, Board of Supervisors. John Mills for the County Executive's Office. Um, we're going to then go to the uh, to public comment, and this is for anybody who would like to speak to an item that is not on the agenda but within the purview of the committee. And I have one card for public comment, and that's Scott Largent. Scott, if you can come on up. Ready, Frank. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. Scott Largent. Tomorrow I have a, uh, a visit at the courthouse tomorrow. I'm taking what I can get. Um, it's a one hour a week visit. That's all the time I get to see my child. I try to use the place out near the airport, but at $400 to $800 a week, it just wasn't happening. There's no way I could afford that. So at our courthouses in Santa Clara County, for anybody that's coming out of recovery, they're poor, they just can't afford that high-end visitation that they stick you with, um, we offer one hour a week. There's still 64 people, Cindy, that are on that list right now. Most of them are recovering addicts, uh, they're passing drug tests, they're doing everything right, and I've started to meet a lot of these people down, down there because we kind of share that same time and you, know, you got to wait in the hallway and your, your kid comes around the bend and you're super, super very excited to see your child. But from the point they go from the floor below up to the fifth floor and you go through the greeting and the saying hi to dad and doing everything and getting in that back room, uh, you know, half hour of playing Play-Doh, your visit's basically done. And then you've got to say goodbyes again. It's the saddest thing I've ever had to go through. Um, I wanted to cancel these visits because it hurt me a lot to see my daughter that way. And I think it's not healthy for her. But then I don't want to give up on it. So it's kind of this, you're, you're tugged back and forth. Uh, Catholic Charity Services of Santa Clara County did offer this program. It was defunded two years ago. They did something special for me and provided it for two months. You know, it was, it was basically out of their budget or whatever they were able to do. They said, Scott, look, we want to help you. We know you were on a waiting list. Uh, during that process, I was able to play in the fountain, I was able to play ball, we were able to color, we were able to do all these things with a therapist, we were able to bond, and it wasn't that short time period. How is that healthy for any child in Santa Clara County to have to deal with? Now our courthouse closes at five o'clock. Why can't we stack some social workers over there, maybe a couple sheriff's deputies, and start providing visitation at night? Why don't we do that over there? Why don't we do that at our facility here? Why don't we have AA meetings, NA meetings, you know, all those other good self-help meetings that people need? You know, maybe we need stuff as far as uh, taking care of elderly grandparents. You know, they do that up in uh, Stanislaus County. They do stuff about dementia and Alzheimer's. They have support groups for that type of stuff. We don't have any of that in Santa Clara County. When we close at five, we all just head out and go home and go get, you know, dinner. It's just really strange. Um, I would hope, Cindy, that sooner or later you might look into that. The person that you're running against for your reelection started a nonprofit, okay, that does deal with stuff like this. It's called New Beginnings. Now, this woman doesn't have any money. She just understands what it's like to be in the trenches and understands what people like me are going through. I've been coming in here a lot trying to get people in power to pay attention. I want to be a dad, and there's a lot of people that want to be parents, and I'm just, it's just sad we're being ignored. We really are, so thank, thank you. Thank you, Scott. So we're going to move on um, from... Our, to go to our consent calendar, are these public comment? So um, here's what I'm going to do. I have a bunch for the, the Family Resource Center. And So I think, I think um, 
The folks who are here for the Resource Center, could you all raise your hand? Okay, so that is not on the agenda today. Do you understand that? Okay, so um, what I would like to do is there, there are what I, let me see, just how many folks there are. One, two, three, four, five. And um, there's somebody for uh, API, is that office also for the Resource Center? Yeah. The Resource Center. Okay, so what I'm gonna suggest is that um, if folks wanna come up, I'll give you all, I, I think we have seven people, remind me of the time on that. Because I'm going to have you just speak during public comment because it's not on the agenda. Okay, so everybody gets two minutes to speak, and I'm just going to ask you if you're able just to line right up. I'll call your names. You don't need to come in the order that you're called, but just if you could line up. And we have one written comment from La Rosa Roundtable. We have a letter in our packet. We're going to ask, um, um, I almost gave you a name, Dr. Mendicucci, but Bob's going to speak at it at his report, which is at the end of the meeting. So if you want to stay, you can hear it then, but you will speak now. Is that all right with everybody? Okay. So if I can have Christy, and I apologize if I'm saying your names uh, improperly, Cyril, uh, Breg Bregif, uh, no name, no name, API. So anybody who, if I just represented you, you have two minutes, please come forward. Welcome. And if you could identify yourselves. Hi, good afternoon. Magandang hapon to everyone. My name is Bridget and I am a Tagalog speaking social worker at the San Jose Family Resource Center. I am here to ask you to keep our resource center in our neighborhood. There are many API families that we serve from different ethnic groups, for example, the Vietnamese, the Filipino, the Korean, Asian Indian, and many more. Many of our API families are immigrant and also fear government institutions. I am asking you to help us to advocate to keep the center in its current location in order to prevent disruption of services. Thank you. Thank you. Um, my name is Misuk Oh. I'm a social worker at uh, CPS. Um, I am uh, me and Indira. Uh, we are representing API, so we are here to support FRC here. Um, the Santa Clara County has 34% uh, API population, and then they came from 51 different countries, more than 54 languages with a thousand of dialects. It is very unique population, and they need targeted service. So, uh, moving the, the community-based the organization to um, the close to DFCS, is kind of a risk for the population that we serve because they are scared to deal with the government service and they're not gonna get service. And there are, they need a lot of language services and transportation and um, whenever they um, come to um, us, they get scared. So they need to um, have a separate uh, location to get served. Thank you. Thank you. Thank Thank you. you. Hello, good evening everyone. My name is Riyak. I'm a social worker with the Family Resource Center. I, I mostly work with the APA families and also Indian families. So my, many of my clients are, you know, middle income, um, working class population. They fear about government intervention. But FRC is a place where they feel it is a non-threatening place, and they feel their privacy is protected there. And some of my families already expressed some fear and concern about going to Julian, because it is kind of, you know, CPS means they have a lot of fear, in, fear about that, and also they feel very intimidated corporate government feel. So we would like the FRC to be kept in the neighborhood where they are. That is more convenient to people for commuting to the place and also they feel very protected there. So that's what I want to do. Thank you. Welcome. Hi, my name is Erica. 
The San Jose Family Resource Center is closing. Please do not believe that this is a move. A family resource center is supposed to be in the community, not in a five-story building, corporate environment building. There were no community or staff work groups to look at the impact to look at the impact this closure would have on the most vulnerable in our community. There has been notice to our, there has been no notice to our clients about the move or closure or the um, FRC. Yesterday's flyers were posted on the internet, but the clients have yet not yet been notified. Clients had had no voice in this closure, and they are who are the most affected. Most of my clients are undocumented immigrants. I know firsthand the difficulties these families face. Most of my clients do not own a car, so we constantly request bus passes for our families. The San Jose uh, FRC and its multicultural units have been in the community for over 25 years. Closing the last of the resource centers in San Jose is a great disservice to the families. Please stop the move until our administration conducts community and staff focus groups. Thank you. Yeah. I'm Christy Bailey. I'm a social worker at the Family Resource Center. I just wanted to say that a government building is not a government building. It is different when it's in a neighborhood, when it's friendly, when it's accessible, when people feel that they can come to us and build relationships with us. It's the same idea with putting the police station, a police station at East Ridge Mall, keeping us in the neighborhood, keeping us in touch where we're not just up in our fortress where people have to badge in to come to us. We're getting split up to be on the second and the third floor of another building. We would no longer be out in the community and it would just be a loss for the clients that we serve who feel comfortable and a good example is our Black Infant Health Program. A lot of those women are refugees from Africa. They're scared of the Julian Building. They don't want to go to that site. And then at our center, they feel safe. And I believe that we will show the real community centers are behind us, staying in the community and willing to back us up and willing to support us. Thank you. Welcome. <clears throat> Good afternoon, my name is Talisha Berry and I am a social worker in the Ujirani unit at the Family Resource Center. And I just wanted to talk a little bit about what Ujirani means and it means um, neighborhood, it's the African term. And the Family Resource Center has become a safe place for individuals in the neighborhood when they're dealing with adversities, they, they know where to go, um, where they will receive services and um, will not be judged for them. And I like what the gentleman said about um, extending hours. The, the resource center is open to nine o'clock. So we have families there after hours that work um, and that attend school. And so we, we're accessible to them um, after business work hours. And um, as you all may know, disproportionality has been on the county um, set for many years. And I think that um, the resource center helps to combat disproportionality also in our county and community. Thank you. Thank you very much. Two of the cards I received were blank, um, and that, that actually equaled the number of people who spoke, but I just wanted to make sure, is there anybody else here that would like to speak at public comment? Okay, seeing none, then um, Bob will respond to this as part of his report at the end of the meeting, so if anyone wants to stay or you can watch it. And I got your questions, so thank you and your comments. Um, we're gonna move on then to approve the consent calendar and to changes to the committee. Um, to the committee's agenda. And uh, what I would like to recommend for consent is um, item six, and this is schooling services with just a, a comment that I would like to make. Item seven, and this is the competitive grant work, and item nine, and this is the extra help usage um, section. And I don't know if there's any comments or anything you wanted to add, Dave, or take away. No, that's fine. Thank you. All right. So if we can move that as it's moved, a, yes. and add that to the consent calendar, great. So we have a motion to receive that and or accept that, and we'll move on then. 
since that's unanimous. And then we're going to go to um, item four, and this is to receive a report from the facilities and fleet department relating to the new hub youth uh, program. Dave, you okay? Got a lot of extra apparatus with you today. Minor bike accident, I'll be all right. <laughs> I really am glad you're all right. Thank you and welcome. Good afternoon, Dave Barry, Chief of Facilities Planning for Facilities and Fleet. I'm here to talk to you about the status of the Parkmore Hub project. Uh, essentially, we are uh, hiring one of our on call services, uh, AE uh, firms, Gensler, to look at feasibility of including housing on the site of the Parkmore Hub project. We anticipate that this will uh, feasibility study will be completed in November, and if it does, if we do determine that it's a it's a good idea and and the board concurs, then we would reassess uh, the whole hub program and how it'd be incorporated into that housing project. Great, and so um, I just we don't have any comment cards on this, but um, I, I wanted to do just do a really quick background on this. The this site. Um, this site was chosen in part because, for those of you who don't know this, Dr. Um, Smith and I had an opportunity to meet with the foster youth that were at the hub, and they didn't like their location, which I ought, is I think is right next to the resource, the family resource center, which is another kind of interesting thing to discuss. But in any case, they didn't like the office building. They wanted to be um, have a, a center of their own, and. Really, through some really good legwork, our staff found a great location. Um, we, our office, um, had talking to Key from housing, was really interested in whether or not we could look at housing for the, for the um, location. In part because one of the challenges we're even having now is that the build, the way the buildings are laid out on the property, it's not the best use of the footprint and honestly I thought we'd be able to put housing on it and still move forward with our other program but it looks like you're taking a look right now at the whole site is that accurate that is correct and um, so and you think the assessment as to whether or not it's feasible to build housing on that you'd be able to come back at the end of November correct and what's the key questions that you're that you have to answer to determine whether or not it's a good housing site. Well, one is about the uh, buildable footprint on the site. There's a number of you know easements and other restrictions on the site, so we have to look at that. Um, we also have to um, confirm with the city, who I believe has inclined to support housing there, but we also have to confirm that as well. Mm -hmm. And then. Um, as part of that assessment is is fleets and facilities also looking at what the cost impacts would be to the hub component of this yeah that's correct so it's possible that uh, through the office of supportive housing they may be able to use I think measure a funds to build housing on top and then the the, the basically the superstructure and then the the amount that would be attributed towards the hub itself would be for tenant improvements within um, the ground floor space for example and what are we at right now for TIs with the, with the structure it is now um, I don't have that figure on me right now but I th think it's it's in excess of 20 million dollars. <laughs> $23 million, dollars, sorry. $23 million. Yeah. And so the idea may be that that the whole thing can be rebuilt, the TIs, for less than that amount of money. That's correct, yeah. So it could be a cost savings overall to the project. Yes, to the just to the hub component of it. Yes. So um, the other thing I would just like you to all to think about, and I, I know the, the key issue is going to be the housing on top, but it would be interesting to understand what the implications would be for the floor plan at the bottom, both in terms of square footage, but also I think one of the challenges we've had with the buildings is that we're moving into something that exists, and you know, you're really trying to fit a, a square peg in a round hole in some of the facilities, if I'm understanding the challenges you've had to date. Is that accurate? Yeah. Okay. And I also want to correct my earlier said it's actually $27 million, uh, so it's quite a, quite a hefty sum there. So there is a good chance that we could have some savings here if we were to incorporate it into the ground floor uh, of a housing project. And then there, there 
you know, it'd be some great opportunities for the people getting those services to actually live on site there too. So there's a lot of great possibilities with this. So one other thing, I um, I had a chance to speak to Jeff, but not to you about this, and and I neglected to raise this one other issue. As you know, the board has been looking at opportunities to add more childcare um, capacity, and so this already had a childcare component to it. One question I would have, is the expanse of the footprint gonna create an opportunity for a more robust set of services, particularly as it relates to childcare, in part because of its proximity to um, a large employment center, which is a hospital, which already has a childcare facility, but I think it's impacted already, um, and in part because of our proximity to, um, uh, to yeah, I think, pub oh, maybe not public health, I can't remember the other, um, we have the hospital, but one other um, service provider who's out there. And and also just to make mention that both, all three of us have had conversations with San Jose City College about partnerships as well. So I more say that because I think that this is an opportunity to pivot not only in terms of housing, but also another policy area that we're looking at, which is childcare. Yes, thank you. Um, so after the feasibility study is complete, if we determined uh, that the recommendation is to build housing on this site, we would revisit the entire program of the hub itself. At that time, we could we could revisit you know you know building a larger, more robust daycare or other types of services that would complement the area too. So um, if I could just make a request that once the November report comes back, that we would be able to hear this, I hope, at the board, even if it's preliminary in December. Like, I don't think that necessarily, if, if you feel like you have something that you want to move on, I, I don't want it to have to come to committee if it slows your ability down to, to move on Measure A or other resources, and also because I think it, it will align perfectly with the discussions we're having about child care as well. I just think the timing may be important. So I'd like to have that come to the full board in December, even if it's kind of broad and sketchy. Sure, that sounds great. Great. Um, Dave, you want to add anything to that? No. <clears throat> no, thank you. All right, thank you very much. Oh, oh, I know one other thing. Can we make sure we talk to the, the young people at the Hub before we if we can before we come to the board. And our, my office is happy to coordinate that with you, but I, I would like them to, I don't want any surprises for those kids because sure. we've been telling them they're gonna get a building, their own building, and they don't like that building that they're at very much, right. as I hear whenever I meet with them. So I'd, I would like to make sure we have a conversation with them, and I'm happy to go out with you and talk to them about why we're doing what we're doing. Okay, we'll be sure to set something up. Great, thank you. All right, we will move on then to item five. And this is uh, to receive a report from the Office of the County Exec relating to the completion of a sexual assault response map. That was my request. No, you got to pull it, or maybe it's that pull it a little closer if it's possible. How about now? There we go. Um, good afternoon, um, Supervisors Chavez, Cortez, and com committee members. My name is Carla Collins, and I'm with the Office of the County Executive and here to answer any questions along with um, Kim Walker. But just to give a quick summary, um, there was a request made for a sexual assault process map to be presented to CSFC to help the committee see both real and potential ga gaps in services from victims who choose to engage with the sexual assault, assault response team agencies. So there's good news, and that good news is that we have all the stakeholders and local experts already at the table meeting regularly with the SART committee. This committee is co-chaired by VMC staff member Kim Walker, who's here today, and with um, the YWCA Silicon Valley staff member Lin Tran Fung. So at the table, we have law enforcement, including the Office of the District Attorney, and all the jurisdictions of police, medical staff, and our Rape Crisis Center agencies who work together in efforts from protocols to discussions on just what the process map is intended to do, identify those gaps or any concerns for services for victims. However, there have been challenges to completing this process. While the content expertise is at the table, time and the skill sets to create the process map have been lacking. 
So the administration is recommending a subset of, or a task force of the SART committee convene regularly um, scheduled meetings to complete the data for both a process map and an accompanying time study. We are prepared to contract services to support this effort and oversee the data collection and preparation of a final product, which will be delivered at the December 18th CSFC meeting. Efforts are underway to secure a vendor with expertise in both process maps and Visio who has the strong communication skill set necessary to keep this effort on track. Um, we want to thank you for your time and patience on this priority item. And if there are any questions for either of us, please let us know. So um, could you talk just a little bit about the, 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 are you doing an RFQ to get someone or do you have someone already to do the uh, subcontract work? We have a few potential um, vendors and we'd like to do an informal um, competitive process for this. So how do you do that and have a product by December? In all seriousness, this, I mean. Right. Yeah. Um, well, we have, um, we're hoping to have identified at least three people or three vendors who could do this. We have the group meeting already, uh -huh. so the vendor would be able to step in. We think it's a matter of just a few short meetings, maybe so let me, two to Yeah, I'm, I may need to be more specific about what I'm requesting. Okay. So I have confidence that you all can meet with people and get them to give you feedback. That is not an issue at all, I think. Well, it's been a little bit of an issue, but you're, you're all moving through that. Here's really what I want to b better understand. From the time that someone dials 911, how are we responding to them through the process of getting them th through, if they go to SART, if they choose not to go to SART, how long are they waiting for um, an examination? Who are they waiting for when they're waiting? How long does it take them to get connected to a to their first real counseling appointment? And I mean I mean the one that hooks them up with services. I don't mean the and and the reason I'm asking for this is that when we had the hearing and when I've talked to individual people who've gone through the, this process, there there are three things they say that I that I think are so consistent that I think we just need to determine whether or not it's, it, it's, the, it's um, more common or not. And one is that they're waiting an awful long time for the examination, not because we don't have examiners, but because they may not have an advocate available or we may not have an officer available. Now, we're trying to deal with that advocate piece with the, with the um, resources that you're negotiating with our two uh, rape, uh, rape crisis centers. Um, but that's one piece, like how long are they waiting and is that a pronounced period of time for victims for, because it's a fact, is it a pronounced period of time because they're processing whether or not they want to press charges? I don't know what the answer to those are, but I want to understand how long do people wait? Are they waiting for an officer? Is there another way we can do that? I, I don't know the answer to any of those questions, but I'd like to. And then almost everybody I've spoken to has had a hard time getting services in a timely fashion. And I don't think that's because our nonprofits aren't working their fannies off. It could, it could be a resource question. It could also be a trauma question. I mean, there's a lot that goes into that, but I, I can't say that I understand exactly what part of the system we need to fund based on that. Now, what I'm certain of is you all having conversations are gonna be able to identify some gaps that we can't see here, but I'm really responding to the feedback we got both at the hearings and then feedback I got privately from people who who had gone through our, uh, unfortunately had the experience of going through our process. So that's really what I'm interested in and what I'm, what I'm mindful of is I'm not sure that's sitting in meetings. I think that literally may be doing what we do when we do time studies for any number of jobs here in the organization. We look at how long are we spending? How, how long does it, are we waiting? You know, all of those things. And I think that the reason I wanted you to get someone outside is I recognize you guys are busy providing services. I don't, I don't want you distracted. I want someone who can give a very objective um, measurements to us so help us understand what the experience of our clients is. So, I think we're on board with that completely. We have already a lot of this data in place. Um, I don't believe we're too far from the finish line, which is why we don't see December um, 8th. As far away? As, as far away, yeah. I don't know, Kim, if you want to speak to how realistic that piece is. 
I think a lot of what we can do, the data is already there. It's a matter of getting the data compiled in a meaningful way so that we can determine the gap times. There are going to be different pieces in what you've identified. That would be law enforcement's responsibility to get us that data. It's going to be from different partners. Mm -hmm. And to have somebody be able to gather that and compile it in a meaningful way for you, and that's what we need help with. Okay. And you're going to have someone who can help you. Okay. And then the other thing I'll just add is that um, I know we've been talking, for example, even with EMS, like I, I recognize that we have another problem, which is just who's gathering data. And part of what we may learn from this process is the reason we don't know all this information is we're not gathering data consistently um, throughout the system. I think we know that, that that's accurate now. Mm -hmm. I think the question is how, how big a gap is it and how fixable is it? So um, so I don't think if, if there's some areas where we have to come back and say we don't know, that's okay as long as we, we then say here's why we don't know and here's what we could do to change it. And I, and I will say I think particularly EMS has been very um, illuminating for me in terms of sitting with them and better understanding how they do and don't quantify um, data. And, and I, it, it get, has gotten me thinking about a lot of first responders, firefighters too. Um, but we'll start with EMS because that's within our, our purview right now. So anything I forgot to raise that you think I should be concerned about? We will be sure to come back with these answers. Okay, Dave, do you have any comments or questions on this? All right, so keep up the good work. And I, I cannot emphasize enough how much I don't want you to you, Kim, not doing your job. I get it. This is really, this was intended to be something that we could do to support you. So thank, thank you. you. Thanks very much. All right. So we're going to then move on to, uh, we, we put item six and item seven on consent. Actually, Sherry, oh, may I just ask a quick question of you? Um, I had an opportunity to um, go to the Sonol Community School yesterday, and I had asked them if they if they um, are part of our schooling services program, and they're not. And I was a little surprised by that, given that they're they own, they are they are by default almost a therapeutic school. And I know you talked to Dr. Duan, like you probably talked to her three times today. Yes. Um, but I was wondering if you both would take a look at um, at the Sonol Community School and just give me a flavor of why that would or wouldn't be a good candidate for schooling services. Sure, yeah. we'll take a look. Yeah, thanks, Sherry. Okay, thank you. Actually, you were on our minds yesterday. We were like, we know who to ask, but then I got to see okay, you today. Great. Thank thanks. You. All right, so we are go going on to item eight, and this is the to receive a report from social services and children's services relating to options and strategies to support resource families. Good afternoon, Francesca Ledred, Director of the Department of Family Children's Services. Uh, thank you for your time today. Uh, before you is a report regarding the funding and supports available for resource families in Santa Clara County and strategies on ways to increase the financial support to resource families. Uh, some, some data to kind of set the context um, before we move forward. Um, as of August of 2019, the DFCS had 915 children in out-of-home placement. This number shows a 4% reduction from August of 2018. More significantly with the implementation of the Continuum of Care Reform or CCR, we've focused on reducing the number of children in group home settings. In August of 2018 to August of 2019, the number of children placed in group homes reduced by 65%. Today, as of August, um, 25 children uh, are currently in a short-term residential therapeutic program. We continue to work uh, to reduce the number of children in group home placements. Um, the children Francesca, that are, can I ask yes. you on that? Um, for those children that you're referring to, are those short-term placements in Santa Clara County, or is that inclusive of every place we've sent inclusive children? Inclusive of all uh, okay. placements, yes. The report provides um, the breakdown Excuse me, we provided that additional information to Amy yesterday, exactly. Oh, I didn't, I probably didn't see it because right. I've read a couple days before. Thank you. Yes. 
Uh, so uh, what I was mentioning is that we continue to uh, reduce the number of children placed in congregate placement. What we do on a monthly basis is send the state a transitional plan for each of the children that are in group home placement. Today we have nine children in group homes. Uh, the total is 18, but that includes children that are in regional center placements, which are not a part of continuum of care reform. So again, nine youth in Santa Clara County are in a group home. So the, the cost of living in Santa Clara County, you know, we all know that it's, it's high. Um, and we have been looking at all that surrounds providing care for our children. Uh, so there have been recent increases at the state for resource families and the statewide reimbursement rates don't match our current um, caregiver needs in, uh, as it relates to the high cost in Santa Clara County. San Francisco is dealing with the same issue that we are dealing with. Uh, the basic state reimbursement rate for a resource family home is $1,000 per month. And so families that take in high needs youth um, are eligible for additional reimbursements, but it's based on the needs of the youth. And so the report tries to provide you um, additional information in a chart format as to all of the different uh, resources that are available. What this report does is also provide you of a sampling of children in different types of placement. Uh, the cost for three children in out of home care, including the cost of wrap services for two of the three children we sampled, ranged from $12,000 to $50,000 during fiscal year 2018-19. Per, per month per child. Yes. Yes. I, just want, I wanted to say that because it's, it sounds like a big number, but I, we just have no, to say it out loud. Per okay. child, yes. Um, a second sampling of four children who were placed in group homes or STRTPs during the year has also been provided to you. So the costs associated with the sampling ranged from 55,000 per year to 138,000 per year. Two of the children in the sampling received wrap services for a few months during the year. We dug deeper, uh, we performed a cursory review of the cost of living in Santa Clara County. We're showing that the medium rent is 3,800 per month. The median cost for a family of four is about $129,000. Um, we, we then looked at, uh, or rather we wanna provide you a summary of the current sources of funding and support. So for the reimbursement rates, if you're a county RFA home, the basic rate is $1,000. You can get additional funding based on the needs of the children. So that would include what's called a special care increment, and that adds to the, the child's basic rate. You have uh, funding sources that help the family and children to address, for example, first month's rent. So that's the housing piece. They receive clothing, clothing allowances. We pay for some activities, um, some educational resources, some respite care. We also have funding to help for home safety improvements. So for example, when we are certifying a home to become an RFA, and it's typically for relatives, if they don't have the money to get the correct smoke detectors and so forth, we have funding to be able to provide those additional um, safety improvements. We provide transportation and foster care um, as well, kinship services. When we looked at a sampling of youth in a, a RFA, FFA, we looked at three youths that were in out-of-home care and for, for uh, the wrap service reimbursement is 3,500. So again, when you're looking at the 18,000 or almost the 50,000, about 3,500 of that is for wrap. I know that this is real complicated and- It's actually not. It's okay, good. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you for that. Yeah. Um, so that's what makes up the rate for these particular uh, three youth. We then looked at a sampling of kids in congregate care for the S or and or STRTPs. Four of those youth were in an STRTP or a group home and the annual cost for these Higher needs youth ranged from 55,000 to 138,000 dollars. 
so the cost to stay at an STRTP for one year uh, is $162,000. So that's thir over $13,000 per month. Youth can stay six months at an STRTP with a approval for additional three months, nine, and then 12. Um, so as you can see, the, the costs vary very much in terms if you are a resource home, if you're an FFA home, it uh, depends on the needs of the child, if you're in a group home or if you're in an STRTP. So CCR focuses on moving the children out of congregate care and into a family setting. And our assessment is that the county needs to provide the professional parent model to care and support some of our dependent youth in our care. A professional parent um, has to be committed and motivated and patient and be willing to provide substantial support on a 24 seven basis. A professional parent essentially their job would be 24-7 uh, care of this child. It means if the child needs um, someone to go to school with them, the professional parent would actually go to school with them. It's a very intense, supportive care and supervision of the child. So we, we've been looking at two ways to increase the funding opportunities to assist our county caregivers to provide the support um, and love that they're, and, and, and love that our children need during these difficult times. One area that we're considering is looking at augmenting the current FFA rate by $1,500 for families willing to take the high needs youth that would otherwise be placed in a congregate set setting. So it, an STRTP is very high level without having a bridge program in place, we believe that adding at, at a minimum $1,500 to the current base rate of 1,000 may uh, be more attractive to a resource parent given the additional support that they, and oversight and care and supervision that they would need to provide to a child. So really here's my question, because I, I, I read the report, I know Dave did too, and Bob, this is really more of a question for you and Francesca, and, and Sherry, I'd be interested in your thoughts on this too, because one of the, what, I'm in, what I wanna better understand is do we anticipate that really what we're, we're recognizing is that we're, we're professionalizing, we're creating a professional parent that we're going to invest some money in training and a professional family and some money in training to help them really support pretty high needs kids and um, and and you know we've got we've got children I think what we're seeing is the more we're going to do to divert children from our system and really support families outside of the system that the folks that we're going to have in the system are going to be relatively high need and I think we've seen that in juvenile reform, and I think we're gonna be the next group to see that. So what I'm really interested in is, are what, is what you're saying that we're accepting that this is a professional role and we're recognizing that in order to support a family like this, you are really talking about somebody being full-time and this is their primary job and we're gonna invest in them. Is that, is that your direction? Yeah, I mean, I, th I think that's, that's definitely the direction and, and I think we've learned some things along the way. One, I think we've always said that the professional parent model is one that would be challenging in terms of finding folks who would do it, but also maybe possess the skills to, to do mm -hmm. it. And we can do different levels of engagement to train folks up and all that. But I think there's also, I think what you're gonna see come out of the system is uh, maybe a different, a, a second model, which is working with some of our providers I think they're recognizing the benefit of having professional staff and another part of that model may actually be uh, providers working with their own staff, offering them per perhaps housing options through some of their own facilities. Mm -hmm. And what you're gonna do is actually have true high level professional staff functioning as a professional parent. It's actually folks who may, have, may be on their staff or folks that they recruit with actual credentials to do this. Because I think it's, in some cases, um, it can work, 
but it's going to be very, very challenging for us to provide all the right services and kind of wrap around to a professional parent family. So in some instances, it will work, um, but I think there's going to be a second model that we're currently investigating with our providers that would actually be, you know, uh, high, highly, highly trained, credentialed uh, folks fulfilling mm -hmm. that professional parent role. And to add to that, this is not technically a new program model because the professional parent really is under what's referred to as the intensive targeted wraparound services. Right, and we've had so, it in the county yes. before, so I know it's not new, but what right. I'm, I'm wondering is, I, I think even when we were investing in this program before, I think we were a little half in, half out in this respect. Yeah. That the, I, think, I think actually it may have been in a conversation I had with you, Bob, about how much training we were putting in yeah. to families who then couldn't afford to live here, and so they were leaving, and then we were kind of trying to train new families. So I get that we have that we have had a relationship with this, that we've got some evidence that this really is a way to stabilize children, but I think the real question is, given how expensive the environment we live in is, are we willing to be all in in terms of, yeah. in terms of that model? Um, or not. That's that's really what I was trying to get yeah. at. No, and I, and I think in the past, uh, the all-in implied that there was a very expensive model, and when we had other options, we didn't necessarily focus on that. Counties would do it where you maybe found the exact right family, and they said, you know what, it's gonna, it, we're going to kind of do this at any cost, and they're paying a family like way above what a, what a uh, normal rate or reimbursable rate would have been, but they just reconciled that with the fact that there was the need but that wasn't attractive to a lot of folks because it was extremely expensive. Mm -hmm. So the all-in thing is, yeah, biting the bullet on the right, expense. Right, and just saying we recognize it. And I, I think the other thing, and I'll go to our speakers, I, but I just wanted to make sure I understood this, is that when I was looking at the, the most recently, I, was, I think I might have been looking at um, an older report that we had to do for this, the state or federal government, you do an annual report on the status of how we're doing relative to foster care. Yeah. What is that report called? I don't know. There, there's yeah. so many. Um, yeah, <laughs> well anyway, it was it was a corrective plan. It was a little bit older. Right. Yeah, so anyway, but I was looking at it and uh, looking at the goals we were setting in terms yeah. of, of um, really trying to intervene in terms of as often as possible leaving with children with their families where appropriate or family members right. and then what the what else we were going to be doing that it does feel like we're really going to be oh. restructuring our system a bit mm -hmm. over the next few years to really address those yeah. those goals i'm sorry the system improvement plan. thank you <laughs> system improvement sorry yes yeah, um, sip or system yes yeah. the SIP, and it's such me. a weird acronym that it, i i it had it in my head but it didn't sound right, right. and I, I think that the, the part of the challenge was the full implementation of the continuum of care reform we didn't totally know what was going to happen when we lost all of the group homes and then recognizing that the STRTP model isn't always the best model for all children and having to look at what, what we can put in place to keep children within Santa Clara County, to keep them in a safe, stable, therapeutic home um, so that, that we can really build a continuum of care within the county and some step down and supports for our children and families. Well, I mean, to be them. blunt, the state created a crisis to make us look at our systems again because I can't have thought this was going to work out of the box. Mm -hmm. And now we're in crisis and we gotta, we're swimming to figure it out. And I think the implications we're seeing in the rake and we're seeing in a lot of other places based on that. All that being said, I'm excited about a course correction and interested in seeing how fast we can do that. Uh, did you have anything else in your report before I go to the public speakers? Um, no, I, it was simply in closing that our, you know, our next steps are in fact to con to develop a request for proposal to be able to um, bring in professional parent model to Santa Clara. Thank All you, Francesca. In, as you mentioned. Thank you. And I think our plan is to do that very quickly. So. Yes. Yeah. Great. Good. Um, Don and then Dana. Good afternoon, everyone. Supervisor Chavez, Supervisor Cortese, and Bob Minicucci in the committee. Uh, my name is Don Taylor, the Executive Director at Epla Family Services. And in regard to this item eight, I am speaking in, in support of Bob's letter and the 
the options for foster services, including the professional parent services. As a provider for over 150 years of intensive services, including, including wraparounds and the professional parent services, I'm, our agency understands the complexity that these kids need. And to be able to support foster youth during these most difficult times of, of their lives. The, our agency has provided professional parent services specifically for the last 20 years, which is one of the strategies noted in this report as you're discussing now. As the needs of the foster youth have progressed over time, as well as the cost of living, our agency has identified um, a couple, the two core impacts that have really impacted us and the services to these kids. One is, again, the significant cost of living over time, which has impacted the number of people available to provide these services, both due to maintaining their own residences with adequate, adequate space and being able to support the youth without having to work another job to make ends meet. The change with statewide continuum of care reform has led to more foster youth successful in the individualized community-based settings, but at the same time, there's this unique set of youth that continue to need high-level support. So the county's willingness to explore the new innovative programming and funding constructs will greatly help with this population, both with recruiting of professional parents and providing the individualized opportunities for foster youth during their highest need. Uplift Family Services is in support of this given our work and we look forward to the next next steps. Thank you. Thanks, Don. Dana? Excuse me, Dana Bennett, Kids in Common. Um, I also think, I, I, I'm really pleased to hear about the augmentation for county caregivers and the movement towards therapeutic and professional parent, because I think our kids that are coming into the system probably do need more supports, you know, if they're being placed in that kind of setting. And I also think a lot of our kids in the justice system that go into foster care would be, it'd be good to have more slots for them also. Um, I am also though concerned about um, some other kinds of small things that we may not have our eyes on. Um, a few years ago, and this may have changed since then, but a few years ago I was um, involved in a teen mom's life and was placed with a family. And the foster mom had to borrow a car to drive across town to get the crib to put, you know, for the baby that was gonna be living in her household. And I think those kinds of things maybe wear on people if they're happening a lot. Another issue I am very concerned about, and again, RAP might deal with this, and um, we may have other systems in place, but trying to keep a young person in their home school, and you know, that may mean driving across town for a foster mom, and, and that's just too much, or parent, and that's just really a lot to ask of them. And yet, we know that school stability is really important to the long-term outcomes for that child. So thinking about how we, you know, asking, Foster parents, what are those little things that maybe wear you down and trying to get to those as we're planning the system? And I do think um, this, uh, this young person was in a foster, professional foster parent, not uplift, so I want to be clear about that. And um, that foster parent actually needed a lot more support than she was getting to deal with that youth, you know, and, and so making sure we're building in those reflective opportunities and help, you know, that kind of help when things go awry. So thank you. Yeah, thank you for that. And um, some of those issues are being addressed now, Dana. Uh, but one thing that that might be beneficial just to get a fresh perspective, if you wouldn't mind having a conversation with Kafka, just to get their sense of where we are on the path, because I think we're from a policy perspective, we're starting to move in the right direction. I'm just not sure what's what's actually being experienced by the foster parents. And remind me, I I, I don't know why I'm. Um, yeah, it would be Denise, but I, I think that they, they came in a couple of meetings ago so we could look at their annual report, and that's also something that would be interesting to take a look at. But I appreciate you raising that, because you're right, we gotta show parents that we really appreciate them, and, and filling everything out in triplicate is not ideal. Thank you. Francesca, is there anything else you wanted to add, or, or Bob, anything you wanted to add? No, thank you. We so you. here's here's just one question I have, and this is actually a question for Sherry. You know, as we as we explore the resource um, uh, resource families, and really, honestly, thinking about this from a much more therapeutic perspective, is is this something that is behavioral health playing a, a role in in this? And if so, what and and how? 
Yeah, so we have been in uh, conversations ar around this with uh, Social Service Agency and DFCS, um, just bringing forward the um, information and supports around behavioral health. So, um, yes, as we've been engaged in um, uh, many situations involving children that have required additional supports, um, uh, we've been also putting forward information and data that we think would be helpful. So we are supportive of this. Definitely recognition of the cost of living that's very Im impactful on families, as well as the idea that um, these resource parents really need to be available 24-7. Mm -hmm. So looking at models across the state and country that do support, in fact, um, housing supports, as well as salary that covers the the um, cost of what a resource parent would be required to do to take this on as a role. Um, we have some information related to what we call therapeutic foster care. It is a Medi-Cal benefit um, that we've been implementing since um, the KDA litigation has come forward. Um, so we've been doing that with four different providers in our community. And um, there's definitely work that needs to be done around that. What that allows for is a foster parent within a foster family agency to actually bill Medi-Cal for some of the types of supports that they're providing to their youth during the day. So um, we can come forward with more information related to therapeutic foster care and the ways in which we think that could be helpful. Um, but yes, we've definitely been involved in, in these conversations. And I think the point you raised just about recognizing that these are, these are mental health, for the most part, yes. services. and. And how do we recover resources? And the reason is, is that I think on the housing front, we're gonna be digging more into our general fund and potentially even looking at some measure A partnerships. But if we could alleviate the service part with more Medi-Cal billing, I think it would give us more flexibility to really wrap our arms around these families and support them while they're supporting our, our kids. And so I appreciate you all are, are playing a leadership role in that, yeah. taking a look at that, thank you. Mm -hmm. Uh, so on the next steps, um, this looks exciting, and from a timing perspective, um, are these going to be initially, are they going to be RFPs, or are you doing RFQs or RFIs? Do you know? The variety of different uh, uh, proposals, uh, methods, depending on how quickly we want to get a few things done. So um, I don't know if we have anybody here from procurement. I, I see that these look like, in the in the body it says RFP. I guess what I was curious about is just given that we have contracts with kind of a set set of agencies, if it was possible for us to expand current contracts to be able to address yeah. these issues. We uh, we met today with procurement just to discuss those very issues. So. Okay, if you wouldn't mind offline letting us know both the timing and the methods, great. Dave, are you good? Good. All right. Thank you. Thanks very much, and Thank thanks you. for the work. This is such a good direction. Thank you. All right. We're going to move to item 10, and this is to receive a report from the Office of Immigrant Relations to the new American Fellowship Program. Good afternoon, um, Chair Chavez, uh, Supervisor Cortesi. My name is David Campos, Deputy County Executive. We have a, a very short PowerPoint presentation uh, that we'd like to, do, uh, to make today. Uh, I'd like to, uh, before I turn it over to uh, Mike Gonzalez, who is uh, acting as the Interim Manager for the Office of Immigrant Relations, we wanted to begin by introducing to you uh, one of our fellows uh, this summer who is here to make uh, just a, some very brief remarks about the program. Uh, here is Marcela Hernandez Castro, and she's actually here with her son, Christopher. So I'll turn it over to Marcela. Welcome, and welcome, Christopher. He's looking for his mic. Good, that's the right, <laughs> added, that's the right thing to do. Welcome. Hi, good afternoon, my name is Marcela. Is it on, is the mic on? Yeah, you have to put it right to you. Go. Yeah. Good afternoon, my name is Marcela Hernandez Castro. And at 32, I am proud to say that I'm a full-time mom to three children. 
and a full-time student at San Jose State University, recently transferred from San Jose City College. I am pursuing a degree in business administration with an emphasis in accounting, and after taking part in the New American Fellowship, I am also pursuing a minor in gender studies. To understand just how much the opportunity meant to me and my family, you should know that I am the first to pursue a higher education, and although both my husband and I met the requirements to be DACA recipients, at the time we could only afford to submit the documents for one of us. Mm. And he decided it was best if it were me, knowing well that while I attended school, we would rely solely on his income. Um, through the American Fellowship, I learned that um, I could only, I not only could be a hard worker, but a hard worker with a purpose. Um, I, I, at the office, I knew how determined they were in um, bettering the lives of many. And the opportunity not only provided some financial relief for my family and I, but um, also taught me that, um, that I could do much more than what I was initially doing. I have my son next to me um, because I want him to feel proud of what I've done. And I want him to learn that um, through hard work, he can reach his goals. He could um, be of service to the community as well. And he can help others just as you have helped me and my family. There isn't enough time for me to say how grateful I am, but um, the commitment I've witnessed with them, uh, I will certainly take that into my future, and um, I will give back as much as I can. Thank you. Thank you, Marcella uh, and Christopher, for being here. And uh, I think that uh, in terms of reporting on what this program has meant, we thought that it would be important to start uh, here and directly for someone who has benefited from this program. And with that, I'll turn it over to Mike Gonzalez, who's going to introduce staff and proceed with the presentation. Thank you, David. Hello, everyone. Again, I'm Mike Gonzalez. I am serving as the Interim Director for Office of Immigrant Relations, as well as the Division Program Manager for the Division of Equity and Social Justice. Uh, before we start, I'd love to give uh, space for the, for the office staff to um, introduce themselves. If I can start first with Carolyn. Hi, my name is Carolyn Lay, um, Office of Immigrant Relations, Public Communications Specialist. Hi, my name is David Acevedo, Office of Immigrant Relations, uh, Associate Management Analyst for the office. And then behind us, we have Teresa Castellanos, and then, and then Melina as well. I think they're well recognized also in the, in, in the county. And then who's not here is also our admin assistant, who is um, Yuan Lee as well. So to move forward, again, I want to take a moment to do you have one other person? Oh, one more person. I, I apologize. We have one more fellow with us as well. Hello, my name is Jocelyn. I was a 2019 New American Fellow. Great. Thank you. Thank you. And awesome. we are expecting maybe one more fellow, so one joins us before we end. We'll introduce her as well. All right. Well, thank you again, uh, uh, Chair, Chair and Vice Chair. Um, I want to take a moment to, um, well, first say that I'm really excited to present this, this report. Um, it has been a, a lot of work to put this together, but I'm really excited to share this today. So before we start, our report will take time to represent some of the background of the program, the goals and outcomes, the cost benefit, uh, 2019 findings, as well as 2020 strategies, and then a forecasting for upcoming years. So in our next slide, um, just some background. It was initiated in 2016 uh, by the Board of Supervisors and at the request of then President Dave Cortese, uh, the New American Fellows provides deferred action for childhood arrivals, DACA recipients, a paid opportunity to serve Santa Clara County, um, County immigrant communities. The New American Fellows provide a paid full-time 10-week experience during the summertime. Um, the Office of, of Immigrant Relations provides complete administrative and program management support. Slide. So in 2019, the New American Fellows Program received over 40 applicants um, from various cities and neighborhoods throughout the county. A total of 15 fellows participated in the program and completed the program this year uh, with the average age of being 24. And to uh, allow space, I'd also like to pass it over to Carolyn. The New American Fellows advances the county's commitment to building welcoming communities by harnessing full potential of immigrants in Santa Clara County, in this case, DACA recipients, by leveraging their skills and unique experiences. We have two major goals for the New Americans Fellowship Program, one of which is to create a DACA leadership pipeline um, so that DACA recipients can develop professionally and gain economic opportunities. Um, 
The second piece is to analyze policies and provide recommendations to improve county services. Fellows presented their research at the County of Dreamers event, um, and I know Supervisor Sin Chavez, you were there. Thank you so much for coming. Um, and they also created posters of the research. In the next slide, you'll see our outcomes. And these are our key takeaways and what we're really proud of for the New Americans Fellowship. The program grew from 15, sorry, from 10 to 15 fellows in 2019. Five fellows received job opportunities from the county and we just learned yesterday that that number is now six. And right. three received job offers from external partners right after the County of Dreamers event. And I'll continue with the cost benefits. The New Americs Fellowship is an investment and work opportunities for DACA recipients uh, that creates a space for them to emerge as leaders in their communities. In addition, there are four cost benefits to this investment that we want to highlight, which is county government, community, economic, academic impact. Uh, I'll start with our county government impact. The program increases county visibility that attracts individuals wanting to work for the county. And we do have a great example of three alumni uh, working for the county. Community impact. DACA's, DACA recipients with what they learned through their work at the county have profound impact in their communities uh, through the lens of equity and social justice. Economic impact. Fellows learn specialized work in public service and gain more opportunities to, to transition jobs with higher wages that translate to higher tax revenue and economic growth. Then we have academic impact. The skills learned such as research, public speaking, and policy analysis are desirable skills that fellows can use to advance their academic career. Then um, Jocelyn will uh, say something about the impact. So uh, being part of the New American Fellowship has allowed me to grow bo both personally and professionally. I was given the courage to embrace my identity as a DACA recipient and immigrant. I gained knowledge and skills that I will take with me moving forward in my career. It also gave me an understanding of what policy work looks like within the county and all the efforts that go into helping our communities. The biggest impact the fellowship had for me was gaining a sense of empowerment and a voice, a voice that was heard and acknowledged. I would encourage all who are eligible to take part of this fellowship as I have never felt a bigger sense of accomplishment as I have been a part of this cohort and community. And I am very grateful for the opportunity. Mike. All right, so moving forward, um, so part of our findings, I think is really important to share. So first of all, to talk about the diversity of the New American Fellows Program, it's really important to share that about only 20% 20 20 um, of DACA recipients represent the Asian community. Um, for this reason, the, the outreach and recruitment was really uh, and not only important, but vital for the Office of Immigrant Relations when we reach out to the new cohort for this past year and for moving for following years. So for upcoming cohorts, uh, the Office of Immigrant Relations will be partnering strategically with all CBOs and as well as the county. And we hope also with the board of directors to really ensure that we promote um, this program across the board to ensure diversity as much as possible. The second is within program management as a finding as well as a strategy is that the new, the new American program and the new American Fellows Program participants increased as Carolyn mentioned from 10 to 15 this year. The Office, of, the Office of Immigrant Relations was able to accomplish the success of this program while maintaining the same staff capacity as previous years. Um, moving forward uh, to ensure success, uh, the office since OIR now is part of the Division of Equity and Social Justice, we want to ensure that we partner not only with the division itself, but also uh, the county CEO admin office. So we really want to ensure that we have many key players to support this, this, this growing program. And then the last is host sites. Um, this year we had a total of 15 fellows across 12 different host sites. It's important to share that seven of the host sites were within the division of equity and social justice. Um, we understand also that uh, it's important to ensure that we bring diversity to all parts of the county um, in places that might lack diversity. So this year we want to ensure that we actually promote our program across the county and by hosting a series of workshops and, and, and listening and, and learning sessions for our uh, agencies to, to participate for the upcoming year. And with that, um, I'd like to move it on over to David Acevedo real quick. So we did. So we did an exit survey for both our host sites and our fellows. Um, we just want to highlight four um, areas here that are important. Uh, you could also see more of the um, survey results in the report. Um, so 93% of the New Americans Fellowship felt that the, uh, it was a valuable experience for their professional growth. 72% uh, believe that NAF was a valuable experience for their academic growth, which is the, um, one of the impacts that we have. 72% uh, 
continue, will continue to pursue a career and opportunity in a specific field of their fellowship as well. And then if we see this last one, 57% responded yes to being interested in pursuing a role in local government. Um, but there, with the possibility of 43 responding, um, you know, possibly they would uh, pursue a career in county government. And so the Office of Immigrant Relations has a New Americans Fellow forecast or a five-year plan, and one of which is that we envision increasing opportunities for professional development for the fellows. Um, and we would like to do this by organizing one-to-ones with county staff and external partners within the fellows' professional interests. Um, in addition, we would like to provide resume workshops, interview preps, and salary negotiation as part of expanding this. Um, we also envision maximizing the New Americans Fellowship as much as possible and to expand programs like the NAF into a sister program that's open to all immigrant statuses while preserving the current program for DACA recipients. So I'll take it from there and just simply note uh, that one of uh, uh, the concerns that, that we heard from some of the agencies that were involved in the program was that because DACA recipients uh, are necessarily uh, predominantly from from a certain background, that by uh, that the New American Fellows Program uh, doesn't necessarily include as many diverse communities, if you will, as if you actually expanded a similar program to apply to all immigrants. So what we believe is one that it's important to maintain. Uh, a program that specifically targets DACA recipients, uh, and, and I think that's what's uh, what's so great about what uh, then uh, President Cortese proposed, and that the way that you can expand opportunities is by actually creating a sister program that actually uh, uh, applies to all immigrants, uh, so that you essentially have an expansion. Uh, you maintain the integrity of the, of the New American Fellows Program, but create a sister program that then will allow a more diverse uh, group of individuals to apply. Uh, so that's one idea that we have, and you know, we, we sort of put it out there with the hope that uh, uh, that's something that might be of interest to, to members of the board in terms of directing us uh, in, that, in that direction. Uh, the second piece is that I, I do, we do believe that this also provides an opportunity for the county uh, looking at the dozens of agencies that are part of county government and, and uh, the various industries that are covered and professions that are covered. Uh, this is an opportunity for us uh, to uh, recruit uh, in those areas that are not as diverse, where you have a, a work uh, population that perhaps lacks diversity uh, for us to actually bring some diversity into those professions uh, through this program, because as you can see, one of the the, the great accomplishments of this effort uh, is that it has led to the actual hiring of fellows in these in these agencies in the, in these professions. So, so we believe that by expanding the pool of applicants, you can actually have an opportunity to increase diversity in some of these professions. So. So we'll leave it at that. Uh, we're very proud of, of this effort. And you know, kudos to uh, Supervisor Cortesi, uh, whose office brought this forward. Because in a very short period of time, you have seen great success and a pretty significant expansion. Uh, again, going from 10 fellows to 15 this year. And I, mean, I think that if things uh, continue the way they are, uh, that number will only grow. And I think it's a testament uh, to the investment that we're making in, in this population, especially given that this is a population that has been targeted at the national level. So, um, so thank you very much for the presentation. And um, particularly Marcella and Jocelyn, thank you both for being here. And Chris has everything in the world to be proud of. So I'm glad he's here to experience this as well. Um, a couple things that I, I just wanted to say. One, I, I did want to just start by acknowledging um, Dave's leadership because it's not only been the New American Fellows that um, Dave has been leading on, but also the Intern and Earn program, which is just hired. We hired a lot of foster kids this summer and kids who are on CalWORKs and just children who want young people. I know you like to be called children. I'm sorry, young people who who really are trying to figure out um, 
their place in the world and, and, and how to fund college and all those things. So I think we're moving in a really good direction. I would like to defer to Dave um, to get us started. I think, I think the only thing I wanted to just um, say is given one thing I think would be of value, and Dave, I'm really more asking you even this, you two, but just to get Dave's thoughts on this, is that it would be interesting to understand the changes that we're making in intern and earn relative to feedback we've gotten from those young people and also um, marry that to what we're learning about the New American, uh, New American Fellows Program because we've got a lot of kids of, of color and of different statuses in our intern and earn program too. And, and I, I think we're, we're now this year at a place where we can really reflect back and say here are some concrete things that we need to do to, to make the programs better. Um, but I think the two programs could learn quite a lot from each other. And so you probably have already sat down with social services to take a look at their, um, you know, their surveys and really better hear about their experiences. And in some ways I think there could be value in really merging those together so we can look at what's, how do we create a pipeline countywide um, and what are the recommendations that are analogous to each other and then what are very different because the needs of the, the populations that we're serving are different. But Dave, I'm interested in what you have to say. Um, yeah, thank you, Supervisor Chavez. Um, and thank you all for being here and congratulations on, on your successes and to all the, uh, the participants. I'm sure uh, virtually everyone was successful, you know, coming through the program um, in value added um, here, you know, in terms of local government and on also to to our county and and beyond. Um, that said, on the specific questions that you were asking, oh, let me let me pause for a moment and say, um, you know, credit where credit's due. Um, our staffs, you know, are in our offices, as you, many of you well know now in the program, work very hard and come up with some great ideas from time to time. Um, well, they work hard all the time, not from time to time, but they have some <laughs> great ideas <laughs> from time to time. And, uh, you know, one of, the, one of our former employees uh, on the 10th floor, Mario Lopez, who now works for uh, a local community-based agency, um, you know, really, Push this hard in my office, and to the credit of the Board of Supervisors, um, it was approved, as I recall, unanimously. Um, and you know, you never you never know when when something brand new, especially when it requires funding, um, if it's gonna if it's gonna make it through the legislative process here, if it's gonna pass, or if you know, all it takes is is a couple colleagues to justifiably say, hey, we want to look at this in a different way, or you know, it has budget implications. So, you know, it was a good idea somebody had, and then it was a board of supervisors as a whole that decided to move it forward. And then these folks over here on this side of the room, you know, took it very, very seriously and decided to make it work. Um, implementation is is not something we take for granted. As, um, there's millions of good ideas out there, but every one of them comes at a cost and, and comes at um, some some management level work, usually significantly, not only to get it stood up, but then to keep it going and make the program sustainable. So with that, it's even more impressive to hear that you're looking at expanding it or thinking about that anyway. Um, I do agree with Cindy. In fact, the, the first thing that popped in my head when you started talking about just expanding the program in general, more more from a fiscal standpoint is, just what she said about trying to marry it up with intern and in, in, um, in, intern and earn. <laughs> I always want to call it intern and learn, but I guess that's true also. But its real name is um, intern and earn, of course. Uh, again, I don't think the programs need to be merged, or I think that would that would probably be a mistake. We want to keep the identity of of this program, and then maybe even, as you said, create. Um, a companion program, another companion program, but I think we sit here and look at, hey, when we have three, two or three programs that are really operating in the same general sphere of influence, um, let's don't make the mistakes of, you know, old county decision making 30 years ago where things just start to go off in, on their own <laughs> in parallel universes and, and, and aren't coordinated. Um, so with this division of uh, 
equity and social justice, you have the opportunity now, you know, not only to talk about everything laterally, but to keep the things that need to be tethered together, tethered together. So I appreciate Sue Roger Chavez's comments about that. Um, it's tricky on the all immigrants thing, of course, um, for at a number of levels. And I think, you, you know, everyone just has to give a lot of thought to that. Um, all immigrants would mean there's at least a couple of demographics that aren't included, um, which would be, I think, a, a serious faux pas on our part if we're trying to be completely inclusive. Um, so clearly, and, and I think maybe what wants to be done if we're trying to create a companion program is, is sort of a, a new to Santa Clara County program, meaning you don't necessarily have to be DACA, you don't have to be a dreamer, but if you're new here, um, this is, well then you're, you're, you're a new American fellow eligible, right? You, you're eligible for this kind of a fellowship so I just think some more thought. I don't want to try to do that on the dais here, but you know, if somebody's Native American, uh, American Indian, or um, you know, generational African American that's new to this area, um, that's trying to get a leg up, uh, or um, and I understand you know the broader um, the broader demographics about immigration. Everybody, everybody's represented, um, almost everybody's represented under the immigrant moniker, of course. So, um, but I think if you get beyond new immigrants, as in first generation immigrants, or even narrower than, narrow it even a little bit more than that, as in first generation immigrants that are new to Santa Clara County, you know, in, in a certain age group, um, you know, all, all immigrants would be, while I would, while I would love some fourth or fifth generation members of my family to have an opportunity like this, I don't think the program is really set up, you know, for them as, and I get it, they're, they're not immigrants per se, but they're, the argument becomes, you know, there's immigrant lineage all around us. So, so anyway, I'm just raising those issues not to say no by any means, but to say yes, but, um, you know, obviously use all your um, equity and social justice uh, wisdom to figure out how to frame it so that it is actually inclusive and at the same time narrowly tailored enough to you know to not have just massive mission creep um, but I'm all for you know continuing to expand these programs and Super Chavez is, and I have talked about these the job opportunity side of it many times over the last couple of years, which is, it's more than heartwarming. And I do, I, sometimes I say, you know, these are not new ideas. These are old ideas that have come back in a better form. Um, you know, when um, I, have, I, have a, I have a person my age working in my office right now on staff that worked in a county summer program um, when there was federal money for that sort of thing and the county was you know, able to hire 2,000 or more um, young people every summer to work in various departments throughout the county. And, and, and we remembered that, and we remembered how um, life-altering in a positive way that, that was, and giving people an opportunity, young people an opportunity to, you know, I always like the metaphor of pull down the attic door and climb up there and see, see what's all around. You know, there's, there's a whole other world there. And you know it was discouraging. I think a couple of years ago, when um, we we started to realize we didn't really have that anymore here, and and really the people in this room, including Mr. Mills, you know, um, and my colleague Supervisor Chavez, moved very quickly to to create that. And um, but that is again a a microcosm of what we would really do if we had all the resources in the world, which is you know create. Um, those kind of opportunities for for all the youth that want them in Santa Clara County, and, and we, we're not that wealthy. We can't do that. But taking the next step with some expansion here sounds sounds really good to me, as long as it's it's thought through and and, and remains, uh, like I said earlier, without being redundant. But the demographics are a little tricky. That's all. Thank you.
And, and if I may, through to the chair, uh, we will take those comments uh, back, and and we haven't really decided anything. Uh, we wanted to to get some feedback, and of course, whatever uh, is is brought forward, uh, we will make sure that we consult uh, with the committee, uh, with board members. Uh, uh, I think what's what's so great about what has happened with this program is that it's been so effective that the idea of expanding you know the, the 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 opportunity to other young people is something that we believe is is at least worth considering uh, but uh, again we appreciate the the feedback do two other um, issues that I would I just want to since we're talking about DACA youth that I I want to raise as concerns when we years ago started investing in our DACA youth, especially through our nonprofit partnerships, one of the goals of that program was to make sure that young people um, could apply to DACA for DACA and that money would not be the reason they didn't do it. And actually, hearing Marcella, it just reminded me that um, I know that. We recently had been looking for funds through our nonprofit partners for money that we funded for um, DACA, and that that money is dried up. And one of the concerns I have is the restructuring of our contracts because the primary objective there was to reach out to young people, make sure they had both legal support and c the ability to pay for those um, contracts. I mean, um, pay for that application and then get through as quickly as possible. So I'm taking a little bit of advantage just to ask if you could take a look at where we are in, in those resources, particularly just given that I think we have another opportunity to get a whole n another batch of young people um, getting their next two-year extension. So I, I was going to do it in the form of a referral, but if you feel like this is enough, John, to just at least get the work done and have a conversation with the board, I'm particularly interested in that because the next time we can have a, if, if there's an emergent need, I want to know that so we can determine whether or not we need to take a different kind of action, but at least through mid-year, understanding what's left in those contracts in what buckets and whether or not we need to add more money. And I, I'm asking that question because if some of those buckets aren't being spent down and wouldn't be spent down by the end of the contract, let's just move the money over so kids have access to it. That's the first thing. Um, the second thing, um, back on the point that you asked about, the New America Fellows Program. I I, I got it. I was so wowed by the presentations. I, were there? Um, did this? Did each of the students do a written report as well? And it's in a report format. Could you could you send those over to us? And um, let me just tell you why I'm asking for them. So every summer, we do um, an internship program in my office, and we've been doing this for years. And we do a very similar stand and deliver framework that you do, only yours is much kinder in a way that um, you're up on a dais and we're all asking you questions. Here it's in this well and people are kind of peppering with questions. But one of the things that we do is that, um, not unlike you, is we try to take very live issues, things that are of big concern to folks, have the youth help us with the research, present on a hypothesis, and then use that hypothesis to to actually bring public policy forward to the board for us to take a look at and try to get those passed in the next 18 months. The, and part of the reason we do that is um, we do it for three reasons. One, almost all the best ideas, Dave and I can tell you this, that we ever get, we get from someone else. Our, our, you know, our specialty is in trying to figure out how to, how to make it fit in our organization. Um, Two, we've also used the reports when um, young people have been applying for colleges or they're going to their graduate programs so that we can demonstrate that the report had impact on public policy so that we can write a letter saying here's what the impact has been. Um, but third, and probably this is the most important, is that it really helps us understand at a much deeper level the experience that you've had and helping us think more critically about those experiences. And I think the point that the staff raised today that's really very powerful is that through the Intern and Earn program, through our own internship program, through the New America Fellowship, the, one of the most significant investments we make as institutions is really what we invest in young people. Across the board, every kid in our community, no matter where they're from, 
our job is to help them have an environment that they can thrive in. That's our, like if you put our job on one line, that's it. There's a lot that goes into it, but that's really it. So in any case, the reason I'm interested in seeing the, seeing these is it will help us think about we're planning for the next 18 months. Like, you know, I, I got some ideas while you all were speaking, but I think it'll help solidify them for me. Okay, so we'll look forward to hearing more thoughts. I would request, if you could, an off agenda, just feedback about your conversations with Intern and Earn. And there's some things I actually want to take a look at with Intern and Earn, too. So we may even want to workshop it here and say, here's what we thought about for New America's Fallow, because we'd want to do it before budget, right? So as early as we can in the year. But maybe look at, um, I'll give you a minute. That's okay. We'll, we'll do we'll do an off agenda memo on that, Supervisor. Yeah, what I was going to suggest is maybe even let's talk to the intern and earn folks, and maybe in December, maybe take thirty minutes to say, "Here's what we've learned. Here where we see some places for growth for both." Because I think the most important thing that you said, you said a million important things, but the idea that we create pipelines for folks to come work for us is really critical in all the programming. And when we met with the intern and earn kids, they gave us three things they told us they were unhappy about. One, they love the program, but then they totally said to me, we, here's what we want. And they wanted um, more clear pipelines to jobs. They wanted um, a little more, they wanted it to be year round and not such a short program so that they could continue to earn money for their school and other things. And then they wanted us not to work with ADP ever again. They all had a terrible experience, not all of them. Yeah, actually they all told me that. So um, so we wanna be responsive to some of the feedback they gave us, well all of it, but to, so I think the staff has some really good ideas based on the, the feedback they got from the intern and earn kids. And some of them have now been in the program two or three years, so they have some attitude about it in a great way, right? Like here are the things you can do. So I wanna make sure we bring that back. So maybe we can have that conversation in December and um, Bob, we can work with you know your, your team. By the way, your team on that program, wow. Really great job. Thanks everyone. Great, thank you. And thanks for being here. We're going to go to um, Bob. It's going to give us a verbal report around item 11. Okay. So I'll take a moment to follow up on the concerns raised earlier around the Family Resource Center and its moving. Uh, first, I just wanted to thank our staff, although they had to return back to their work, uh, to take the time and come and share uh, their thoughts and concerns with us. We know. Uh, it can be a little daunting to step up and do that, especially if, uh, if folks are sitting up here uh, look, looking, looking at them. So I appreciate uh, the, bold, the bold move to come and, and share. Um, we, we definitely share the same concerns, I think, that, that our staff do around access and, and meeting, meeting families where, where they are. A little bit of history, um, the FRC, which is located uh, on King Road, um, we have had challenges with that facility at a number of different levels. One, just feedback from um, our youth, but also folks who participated in services at the FRC had said it's not uh, sort of the most desirable uh, location for them. It's located in an area that is sort of semi-office, semi-industrial, and really doesn't, I think, from, from our perspective, meet the needs of being in located in the community uh, where, where our recipients are at to meet our, our clients uh, where, where, they, where they actually live. So uh, when the opportunity arose to rethink um, uh, our location there, partly because of the hub leaving and thinking about what we would do to backfill space or whether or not this is a location that we would want to move on from, uh, we've had other challenges there in terms of just the age of the facility, as well as just uh, cooperation uh, with, with the landlord at times. So we thought this was an opportunity to rethink how, how we do our service delivery. Um, in addition, there was another opportunity in terms of what we were talking about earlier and just the continuum of care reform. Um, it is shifting the way we do our, our business. There's an expectation of how we conduct our, our work with families around doing child and family teaming meetings. And again, when we do those meetings, it would be most beneficial to again meet our clients where they're at. So we're in the process of adapting our whole approach of how we do our business to immerse ourselves much more deeply in the community. So our child and family team meetings, any service delivery that we can do where appropriate, we're looking at doing visitations in the community and 
through this process, what we're, in, what we're in the process of doing is working with First Five as well as some of our other uh, community partners around how we can co-locate with them and have much more effective service delivery. I've always been concerned about having folks come to us where we have a limited array of services and folks may need to then move on to another provider to get a, a service that we don't offer. If we co-locate, we eliminate that step. We make the, the, the issues of how to get, get to the locations easier because we're in the community, um, as well as just hopefully improving um, the, the whole concept of being sensitive to the very particular needs of each community um, that, that, that we, that we are, are serving. We think there's a few uh, advantages along the way. Uh, from a sustainability perspective, um, as was outlined in the note from La Raza, we used to have more services at our uh, family resource centers. And when the economy contracted, it was, import it was, it was necessary to, to scale back those services. And what we hope is by having a co-located model, we have a more sustainable model where we won't ride the roller coaster of the funding cycles. Um, part of what we hope through this too is that um, staff have also said sometimes they feel isolated being out at that location and don't always know or feel part of the work that's happening at, at uh, DFCS. What we intend to do is to move that staff to, a, to our central location so that they can be part of all of the work that's happening. They can team with our other units around the development of work along the way and be part of that, part of that workflow that's happening that they're missing out on now. Just like all the other um, services that uh, we do deliver, our staff are housed centrally but are out in the community, whether it's our continuing workers, whether it's our emergency response workers, whether it's our, our DI workers. Folks will get out in the community to do the work that they need to do. The campus at Julian is the central location where we can come together, do our information sharing, do our team building, things of that nature, and then disperse to the community as necessary. I do want to be clear that we will have some services at the Julian location. We do believe that for some folks, it will be convenient if you work in the area and you're coming in for a class uh, in the evening. Um, this, this will be good. We recognize there are transportation challenges in terms of our exact location. There's public trans transportation nearby, but not right at our location. And we're working to address that. We do have a plan in place and are working to sort out all the particular needs. We will make the commitment of ensuring that we will meet the transportation needs, just like we're doing with education and things, things of that nature. So we're very hopeful that moving forward, this is a positive mood of having us get back deeper embedded in the community to serve the communities. And we acknowledge there'll be challenges along the way. I would encourage community members, our staff, to continue to give us that feedback so we can continue to improve. But all in all, all things considered, uh, we're hopeful that this will have us working much more closely with our community partners, our community providers, and better serve our community. So um, just if, if just to get a couple questions based on what you just said, could you talk just a little bit about the what the what the center is doing now? Like I know it had a it had one set of activities, but what are, what's core there now? So for the family resource center or just the location? Just the family resource okay. center. Francesca, do you want to? She'll she'll be better to give the array. And are we considering Julian the center, the center of services now? Or the center, because you used that term yeah. back in the center, and I always think of um, right. Center Road as being where all your activity is. So what our hope is, I mean, we've always had some uh, child welfare services out of that campus. And what we want to do At is- Julian Street. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. Um, what we want to do is actually bring a little bit more to that. So our campus is actually a mixed use campus. It isn't all administrative. We'll also be bringing IHSS to there too. So we'll have client interaction there and it will be more integrated than it, than it has been in the past. I'm sorry. <laughs> so we provide a variety of services at the Family Resource Center. I think it's important to talk that the King Building King Avenue building really houses different programs here. But the, the key component that everyone is talking about moving is the San Jose Family Resource Center. What it really is, it's a location where community and 
at service, service providers can come and provide classes. Parenting, DV, Al-Anon uh, are some examples. Um, those services will continue. At that same location? No. The services, some of the services will be moving to the Julian site. So, so in essence, when we talk about the building closing, what happens is that the building closes and the services will be moved to the Julian office. So we're going to have Al-Anon and DV classes and all that so at we, night we would, at Julian. We would, we would have, no, not necessarily. So some, some, but. Al-Anon, we have an MOU with the Al-Anon group to provide space. We are working with that group to, can, to find space in the community so that they can stay in that particular community. Um, so we're looking at each one. We have a black infant health that we want to meet with the Roots Clinic so we can move that program to the Roots Clinic. So we're looking at each and every service component that's per currently being uh, provided out of the King Avenue office to see whether or not it should continue out of the Julian or should it, con should it continue in, in fact, a community agency. So um, let me make a request So, because I, 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 I feel like I'm just going to pepper you with questions and that's <laughs> not necessarily helpful because you didn't know I was going to do this. So here's what I would like to know. What are all the services being provided there? How many people um, now get those services, and which of those services will d be dispatched into what location? Okay. Um, and, and in part because I've been to the Julian Street building, God, many times, and you know, I'm not, I, I don't know how inviting that is or isn't to, to go into the building, depending on what's being provided there. So whatever is being provided there, and understanding that relative to what we're providing on center. The thing I will say, and I know Courtney, you're still here, so one of the things I'll tell you is that. Um, I have had concerns about the building there for a while because we've had difficulty with the the landowner in terms of full access of the building. So they don't always let us do stuff on the weekends, and they wouldn't they want us to pay extra for some things. They wouldn't let us put a shower in the the hub for the kids, and I mean, just they they've been really really challenging to deal with. I didn't realize that we were this far along in terms of starting to move things out, but for sure, exam for example, we're taking the hub out of there because we can't, it's not that, it's not a usable facility for, for at least that service. Um, so the service is provided, where they're going, and also how many staff do we have in that, providing services in that facility? Do you know off the top of your head? We, um, we have approximately 50 staff that work. That are part of the resource center? Or, um, no, not no. necessarily. We have, a, uh, duly involved youth. We have the child and family team facilitators. We that have are part that are in the resource center that sit on the, if you will, the left wing. You know. Of okay. The so really, what I'm interested in is the resource center, and then the other building. Since we're going to need to eventually move everything out of there, where are the other services going? Because some of this will make more sense if you're, because you're not just talking about one. You're going to be moving everything. slowly. We're moving yes, everything. So the out. hub will stay there until it can move to right. park more. But everything else is going to be. Stay at, at um, King. Any, right. any services related to the hub will remain at King. Until the hub moves. Until the hub right. moves. Right. But the other services that are Correct. affiliated to the Resource Families Center, Resource, right. what is it called? The, re, the Family, Family Resource, Resource Center. Family Resource Thank Resource you. Center, yes. If those, if you could just explain what's there now and where they'll be going. Yes. Um, and then the last thing is only this. Did, is it true we really, we didn't talk to clients and we didn't talk to staff about it? This is a conversation we've been having yeah. for some yes. time. With yeah. the staff and the clients. With the, s with the staff. Yeah. But not the clients. I have not had any communication okay. with, with well, the Okay. Well, I actually clients. think it's good feedback for us that if we're going to be around client-centered design and empathetic design, that we're talking to the people who service we're providing services to. I, I think that's just got to be very typical part of how we think right. about what we move where we move it. So, all right, I'll look forward to getting that as soon as possible, and then Dave? So will that be something coming back here or off agenda? Or I mean, you asked these questions, which are great questions. I'd like to hear the answers well, also. I, and I'm, I know it's up to you yeah, how we, no, I, chair, actually, how we hear it. Actually, I'd love your feedback on it. What I was gonna, what I was hoping to get was get them as quickly as possible in writing so we could actually have a conversation with the folks who came and raised issues with us, and also just, more because I, I just don't have enough information even to respond. So I was really looking for kind of the basics. But what do you, do you have an idea? I'm all for ideas. Well, I, th I think just 
keeping it on the agenda and having an update, uh, not that we wouldn't want to get these answers quicker than 30 days, but um, as to how the transition's going, because um, it's it's pretty, it may maybe there's something that's gonna work really, really well here, but it's definitely significantly different geographically, um, at, a, at a minimum geographically than, you know, what, not only what we're accustomed to, but where I believe <clears throat> the highest need for some of these services reportedly is sort of that 95116 slash 95122 zip code. Um, and then that King corridor there between what depends, you know, we got the transit hub at, at Eastridge, but you got line 22 going right through there, which takes people, you know, back and forth, up and down right. that, that pretty right. much that whole area. So I'm not, I'm not suggesting that we need to, so we can bring it back. We'll put yeah. it on as a forma, formal agenda item and maybe talk about the transportation piece too. But I think, you know, one other thing, and it might be worth having Jeff Draper come talk to us because part of the problem is, is that we've been looking at moving out of that building for any number of reasons. Right. And then some of the buildings on center, we're also doing something similar because mm -hmm. they're gonna be redeveloped. Yep. And I, I just wanna make sure we're having those conversations mm -hmm. with our employees so they don't think it's right. just willy nilly that right. we're, sure. you know. Makes but sense. Jeff could help us help talk to the, to our staff about that as well. And Supervisor Chavez, I want to just second that. I agree with that wholeheartedly is uh, where I was kind of starting to go is, um, and I don't have any, I mean, it's your district, it's not mine. I don't have any, um, you know, financial interest uh, or anything like that um, um, in, in anything going on at Eastridge. But I know you and I were over there meeting with some, some doctors um, uh, dealing with cervical cancer issues and, and such. And, and I don't know if, if you recall that, but right next to the transit hub, that newly remodeled building's got um, space, uh, you know, beyond the doctors that were resident there that were right. were available. And I remember, um, not to, this is not a negative on, on Rene Santiago, but he was with us. And I remember yeah. coming back to, to him as we were leaving and saying, wow, what an opportunity here. Yeah. Um, if the county needs to move things, social services like this or whatever, in, in sort of a medical professional building that's literally sitting on top of of the busiest bus hub in the entire county. Yeah. Um, do you know so, what he's referring to? And it's in, it's, it's sort of just, you know it's sort of, I, what I was trying to say earlier is it sort of just straddle, that, that, that sort of straddles this, uh, yeah. th you know, the, the zip code areas where yeah, people were used really to physically point. coming. Mm -hmm. But I, I say all that because it's probably on the Jeff Draper side that we have yeah. to have that conversation. So, so when I think the the point, so yeah, let's have it all come back to our next meeting. But, but it would be really great to have um, Jeff. And then the other thing is, we haven't asked Jeff to do this, but John, if you could through um, Dr. Smith ask Jeff just to go have a conversation with VTA or someone from his team on that. There's both the the. There's a, a facility that VTA, I think, is keeping ownership of where they're doing some work with folks who are disabled who need to get tested to be able to use the bus, you know, like what, whether they can have access to paratransit or what other kind of services. But that building, which is not fully utilized, is next to another building that's not fully utilized, and they're right at they're right at the hub. He's he's totally right, and we've been over there for different things. It's maybe worth you all looking at because it's just so wonderfully located. And your other point, even if that was the place you did the meetings that you talked about, I mean, you you, it, you it's hard to not be able to get there. I mean, you'd almost have to try. Right. <laughs> we'll, pr we'll provide results of we're we're surveying our parents the participants of the classes so we'll we'll have more information in terms of transportation we're saying that most of our parents are actually driving to king avenue so I'm, oh is that right yes so yeah. we'll have more information more survey results to be able to provide in the report to you yeah that's great and this this one every bus route in the universe it's up it's on capital and um tully right is it Story and Capital or Tully and Capital there? At Eastridge, you guys come. Tully, okay, thank you. Reed Hill View, I've only been there all my life. Yeah, Quimby, Tully, Capital, the triumvirate there. Great, thanks for that. Do you have anything else you wanted to give feedback to? Ignacio? Yes, thank you. I just had a legislative update on Assembly Bill 1092, uh, authored by Assemblymember Jones Sawyer out of LA. Um, it actually has passed both the Senate and the Assembly, 
and is headed to the governor's desk uh, for signature. It amends the family code to do two specific things, both of which um, I believe are positive changes. For cases that we have where we're collecting um, public assistance reimbursement because a child was receiving some sort of public assistance, oftentimes CalWORKs or welfare, uh, those cases have a debt that is owed and that debt under statute uh, is required to have a 10% interest attributed to it annually. Wow. Yes. This assembly bill actually reduces that 10% interest to zero, that's effective great. January of 2022. So that's a significant um, benefit in terms of helping economically fragile families, uh, parents who are trying to pay off child support debt for public recoupment and making sure that that debt is um, not arbitrarily increasing um, at that 10% interest rate. So that's a positive. And then the other element of this um, assembly bill is that it also allows the Department of Child Support Services uh, to deem certain delinquencies owed to the government, both the county and the state, um, as uncollectible, uh, meaning that we would be able to take into consideration specific factors like income and assets available um, to pay that arrearage or that debt, the age of the debt, um, employment history, payment history, incarceration history. So it gives us a tool to be able to address uh, uncollectible debt and not allow the artificial accumulation of debt, which oftentimes is a barrier not only for economic self-sufficiency, but if folks are dealing with a history of incarceration, it's a barrier for reentry. Because mm -hmm. once they start getting on their feet and they're trying to pay that debt off, um, it makes it difficult for them to be able to do that when um, they have all these other expenses they're trying to, to address as part of that process. So, so Ignacio, does that mean that Essentially, it doesn't exist anymore, so they don't. It doesn't impact their credit at all. Yeah. So as of uh, January first of 2022, uh, whatever debt would be deemed uncollectible, and this is only for debt that's owed to the government, to the county, and the state, uh, they would no longer owe that amount. Wow. And so, in essence, it's almost like a, um, a, a forgiveness yeah. program for that government debt, which I think goes a long way to help uh, economically fragile families address uh, what could be a very difficult. Um, uh, obligation for them to meet so uh, so that should be going to the governor's desk it passed both houses of the Senate it was just enrolled within the last week and so I just wanted to give an update on that um, and if there's any other questions I'd be happy to answer them Those, that sounds like good news yes yeah congratulations well we now kn will know when there's a signing party all right anybody else on any other subject seeing none we are adjourned until um, Wednesday, October 16th at 2 p.m. Thank you, everyone.